by the time the evening comes that you know you're going to be engaged in that little red booklet study, it can be exciting. It can be intimidating. Because if you're studying this with someone else and you have an idea of what the content of this study is, what the, the end result you hope will be, but nothing's guaranteed. It can be exciting. It can be intimidating. But we let God's Word do the work. Well, Scott, let God's Word do the work. You just walked up there with eight libraries. Well, everything that we have here is simply notes and illustrations. This is what we're studying. And we want to keep that ever in mind, not just in our own minds, but in front of the, the souls with whom we're endeavoring to study. We're opening the Bible. That's our source. That's our material. This is where we learn how to follow God, how to live for God, who we are to be and who He truly is. All of the rest of this is just an organized approach to note-taking. That's really all it is. Now, as we begin with this little red booklet, this is the one that will come to the point of asking for commitment, giving an opportunity to, to make a life-changing decision. The previous booklets, Lessons 1 and Lesson 2, uh, were both informative and instructive and hopefully engaging. They asked questions that would uh, check understanding and in many ways gain commitment. But, but here's where we've been headed. That being said, this morning during the sermon period, we examined some of the details contained in the initial pages of this red booklet. As we return to it, one thing to keep in mind, you, maybe you've, you've had dinner with the person with whom you're studying, maybe you've just met to go straight to studying, whatever the case, as you sit down at the table, as you unsheath the pen, as you open the Bible, as you turn to the beginning of the booklet, what's not written in this booklet still needs to be written ever front of your mind, and that's the fact that the person with whom you're studying is in all likelihood fully convinced that he or she is already a Christian. They already think they're saved. And it's not up to us to tell them. It's up to us to help them find that in Scripture and draw the conclusions themselves. So that's what we endeavor to do. Now this morning we uh, examined several of the passages contained in the early part of the study. Iniquity separates man from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And we talked about those questions and the first several sections of this study in booklet 6. We looked at the idea that uh, not only what is sin, but how it uh, develops, how many have sinned, and the need to do something because of it. We will not return to each of those passages, as already noted this morning, other than to say that uh, sin is a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. To say that uh, according to James 1, 14 and 15, sin starts within my own heart. It's based upon my own lust. James 4, 17, I sin when I decide that I'm going to follow after a, a path that does not include God in it. I, I, I know what is right and include God in my plans, but I opt for a different direction. We consider how many have sinned. There's none righteous, Romans 3, 10. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. Thus we uh, look at the consequences of that sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. A series of behaviors is described there in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 that all qualify as unrighteous and therefore soul damning. Our goal is as we move through these passages to let the, the student with whom we're studying uh, draw the conclusion of exactly what sin is and hopefully come to the realization uh, of the reality of sin. The fact that God is just. The angels declare His justice. We ought to know of His justice. He, he's not a, a, a face looker. There's no respect of persons with God, Romans 2, 11. Instead, God is absolutely just in all that He does, and He judges in such a way. Ultimately, coming to the point that we think of Hebrews 5, 9, He's the author of eternal salvation to all that obey Him. And that's where we want to pick up with this study as we move forward, looking at what it truly means to obey Him. 
we, we briefly covered the first pages of this study already this morning. Now, as you come to page five <clears throat> in this study, one thing worth noting is there's a question, what must I do to be saved? What is contained at the bottom of page five and the top of page six is actually a uh, shorter version of the back to the Bible survey that in all likelihood you have already done with the, the person with whom you're studying at the beginning of your study. And if you have, then you have an option right here. You may ask the person to, to fill this in again, just, just for the sake of refresher. Personally, I usually say, let's skip this part. Because at this point in the study, they may or may not be starting to use a revisionist history of their own uh, decisions and faith. And we want to allow them to compare what the Bible says with what they were convicted of believing before the study ever started. Because if that contrast is ever going to be made, then it has to be done in an honest and open way. So we turn to page 6 in our study, looking at God's plan for salvation. And we begin with John 3.16. The first, uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoso believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is no need to drop tent pegs as we move through this study, talking about the idea of uh, belief and repentance and confession. Uh, unless objections are raised immediately in moving through these passages, such as, see, all you have to do is believe. Well, the word all you got to do, which is not one word, it's several, or only is not contained in John 3, 16. Belief is, though. The question under John 3, 16, the condition stated here is belief. Must a person believe in order not to perish but have everlasting life? Yes. Moving forward to John 8, 24, Jesus said, Except ye believe that I am He, shall die in your sins. The next question on our sheet asks, Will you be saved if you do not believe in Jesus? Without getting into a full and complete debate about the extent of belief and what all it is, just basically and fundamentally, is it necessary? Yes. Will you be saved if you don't? No. Thus we move forward, because typically speaking, there's going to be a general agreement about the idea of belief. The next question, Acts 17.30. He's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Thus the condition stated here is repentance. Much like belief is necessary, we need to ask the question, uh, when we talk about repentance, how vital is it? 2 Corinthians 7 verses 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul said, We rejoice that you, were so, uh, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. Uh, that you might receive damage by us and nothing. Paul not only rejoiced that these people were sorry, but that their sorrow was a godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10, Godly sorrow works repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. The sorrow of the world worketh death. Within the first series of questions, we've already hit on the necessity of belief, and now the necessity of repentance. And repentance, based on what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 9 and 10, we can answer this question, is merely being sorry for your sins the repentance that God demands? Well, Paul said, we, we rejoice that you were beyond merely sorry for, uh, for what you'd done, but you had a godly sorrow. It, it's more than just regretting the deed. There are some that regret a deed but simply because of the repercussions and the punishment. Godly sorrow goes beyond that. So repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry, there's more to it. 2 Corinthians 7.10, Godly sorrow works repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. Repentance in and of itself pertains to change. Does repentance demand that the sinner turn from his sins, that he change? Absolutely. So we go ahead and we move forward. We look at Luke 13.3. Jesus said, except you repent, you'll likewise perish. Thus much like the question with belief, uh, if a person does not believe, will he die in his sins? Yes. Can a person be saved without belief? No. The, the question under Luke 13, 3, will you be saved if you do not repent? Simple, straightforward answer, no. We move forward. This time Romans 10, 10. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The question that follows from that simple statement from Scripture is this. The condition stated here is, well, it says... 
with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with, with the mouth man confesseth. Uh, confess, oh, we've already talked about belief. The next condition stated is confession. So, the next question that's going to follow comes from Matthew 10, wherein Jesus said, Whoso shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. If we confess him, he confesses us. If we deny him, he denies us. The question connected to that passage is simply this. Will you be saved if you do not confess Jesus? And once again, the answer is going to be no. In very short order, three major aspects of what it means to obey the gospel have been discussed. A belief in Jesus and who He is, that He's the Son of God. A repentance of sins. Uh, not only a, a saying of, I'm sorry, but a desire no longer to live that life. A confession, an acknowledgement of Jesus' identity. And now we move forward. The next passage, 1 Peter 3:21. And much like with every other verse we've read so far, the, the corresponding question is simply the condition stated here is, let's read the verse. 1 Peter 3, 21, The like manner whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What obligation, what condition is stated? Baptism doth now save us. We're talking about what it means to be saved, the condition stated being baptism. Sometimes it may help to break the verse down into the, the simplest form. What's the uh, noun? What's the verb? Baptism saves us. The next question. We come to John 3, verse 5. Jesus would say, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he shall not enter into the kingdom of God. It, it actually requires effort to dodge the obvious meaning of uh, be born of water and of the Spirit. The, the question to correspond with this passage is simply going to be, will you be saved if you're not baptized? Baptized, born of water, okay. Uh, will you be saved if you're not baptized? No, N not according to what Christ said there. Now, there are some that will try to debate that or argue around the meaning of uh, 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 what it means to be born of water. That being said, we can go ahead and move forward. Because even if they do not answer this question properly, the questions that follow are intended to look at exactly what Scripture does say and to petition commitment on the part of the one with whom we're studying. The next question on the page is Mark, it comes from Mark 16, 16. But before turning to Mark 16, 16, we've talked about the Evangelism Visualized Workbook. And again, it bears repeating that all this uh, book is is a book of illustrations. In fact, we might describe it this way. The more a person has engaged in evangelistic Bible studies with people, the more that individual will have a series of illustrations and frequently be ready to use those illustrations depending on what the question or potential objection is with, uh, from the student, person with whom he's studying. It could be the case that you have all of these illustrations in your head because you've already uh, engaged in so many Bible studies with folks and so you don't come bringing a wagon into the Bible study so that you have all your booklets. That's great, terrific, wonderful. But it's also just fine to have a booklet with you that has simple illustrations on a page. And the more accustomed you come to using them, the more natural the use of the, uh, their usage does become. And sometimes you, you may just draw an illustration on a page. That being said, these are just pre-drawn illustrations. So, the first illustration to, to note in this study is going to come from chart 21. What does the Bible teach? We want to ask this question before we read Mark 16, 16. The reason being is much like, much the same as the reason that we want to uh, have the person do the Back to the Bible survey before uh, studying the topic of baptism because we want to avoid that revisionist personal history of what a person's motives and beliefs were in the past. So, when we ask this question, what does the Bible teach? Is it A, who, he who believes is saved and then baptized? 
or is it B, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved? Chances are they're going to put this. Don't be surprised if they do. Don't be surprised if they select the first one. He that believes is saved and then he's baptized. In fact, what we want is for people just to be honest in what their convictions are. Because the only way any soul is ever going to come truly to recognize a disparity between his beliefs and God's is for him to be honest about what he actually believes. So, we give them the opportunity to answer this question with all honesty, and we move forward. Looking at the question from Mark 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The first question under Mark 16 is, Jesus said we must blank and be blank, believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Now, it's at about this point that a question is going to arise, especially among some of our uh, more seasoned denominational friends. They're going to say something along the lines of, but wait, it, it, it doesn't say he that believes not and is not baptized shall be condemned. It just, says, it, it just says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He, he that believes not shall be condemned. A good way to approach this would simply be first, be positive. Okay, that's a good observation. Would it be all right to focus first and foremost on what the passage truly does say? Rather than debate the implications of the observation that was made, let's, let's look at what it does say first. Uh, the next chart contains a structural analysis, chart 22 in this booklet, a structural analysis. Sometimes it helps to replace some words with others just for the sake of comparison and contrast. For instance, you might say, when it comes to salvation, it can be a very emotional issue, <laughs> especially in the world in which we live today when so many base their salvation on emotion instead of the scriptures, salvation can be a very emotional issue. And sometimes emotion can get in the way. Emotion can actually cause us not to see clearly. Let's replace the words believe and be baptized with, with some words that might not be as uh, seemingly volatile. So, so some words that we can simply assess the, the sentence. Well, let's put it like this. He that eats and digests shall be safe, but he that eateth not shall be condemned. You might even replace safe and condemned with filled or hungry. Or you might re replace them with fed and starved. He that believes, uh, he that eats and digests shall be nourished, but he that doesn't eat shall be famished. Now, you think about that, and if a person does not eat, is he going to digest anything? Step one is prerequisite to step two. Without step one, step two can never happen. There, there is no qualifying and proper step two. Thus, when Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not, he didn't have to say, He that believeth not and is not married. Uh, and is not baptized, just like a person wouldn't have to say, he that is engaged and gets married shall be a husband. Well, he that is not engaged, well, if he's not engaged, he's not going to get married. There, there's a step one that has to come before step two. So if we will take the illustrations before us and put it in ways that are somewhat less volatile, it can actually uh, help folks come around to seeing the implications. We go ahead and we move forward. Uh, to say that to say that what we have before us is a, a simple statement can at times come across uh, as assuming a bit much. So we, we want to be patient as we examine the statements with folks and, and be patient as they arrive at conclusions and, and when they come to the point of saying, oh, I see that. We also want to be careful about being encouraging instead of saying, aha, I gotcha. Moving forward, we come to Acts 2, 38, wherein the apostle Peter will say, uh, he that believeth, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The inspired preacher told these believers, Acts 2, 38, to repent and be baptized. Now, 
Also, according to Acts 2.38, repentance and baptism are for the remission of sins. Okay? For the remission of sins. Now, it, is it going to be important to talk about the meaning of that statement, for the remission of sins, and endeavor to illustrate that? Another chart in the booklet that can be helpful, chart 26, uh, essentially deals with how some people will uh, look at repentance and baptism as uh, separate in value. Yet, Peter said, repent and be baptized. That, that word connecting the two, and, it's a coordinating conjunction. One way to illustrate it might be to think of a coupling on a train. Uh, a coupling on a train puts the, uh, the same weight on the car before as the car behind. The, uh, they're linked together. They're on the same track. They're going the same direction. He that believes and is baptized, if you remove the and, then you unhook the train. Uh, you don't have the whole picture. He that believes and is baptized, uh, repent and be baptized, Acts 2, 38, 4 unto the remission of sins. Without the, the combination, there is no unto, there is no for the remission of sins. So when we look at the and the right way, then we can put equal weight on repentance and baptism. How often do we come across folks in the denominational world that say, well, you don't gotta be, you don't have to repent. You, you, you don't even have to say, I'm sorry. You, typically speaking, even though our friends may be inconsistent with the way they describe it, they'll acknowledge, at least on some level, the necessity of repentance. Well, if they're going to acknowledge the necessity of repentance, they can't deny the necessity of salvation as it's coupled with repentance hand in hand. So, Acts 2.38, having noted those questions, we'll go ahead and we move forward. This time, we want to look at Ephesians 1.3 taking a look at what the benefits are of being in Christ and when those benefits are contained. Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All spiritual blessings. There'll be a chart in a moment that will detail several spiritual blessings. All great, uh, all things we ought to want to receive. The short and sweet description is they're all in Christ. Why is that important? Ephesians 1, 3, are all spiritual blessings in Christ? Yes. Okay. If all spiritual blessings are in Christ, are there any spiritual blessings outside of Christ? No. Okay. Let's let this develop. 2 Timothy 2, picking up at verse 10, the observation made by Paul is that I suffer all things for the elect's sake, that they may also uh, receive the the salvation that's in Christ Jesus. Once again, the idea of the blessings being in Christ. Where is salvation, or is salvation in Christ? 2 Timothy 2.10, yes. Is it your understanding that one must be in Christ to be saved? Well, Paul said salvation is in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Is, that, is it your understanding to be in Christ? Yes. Okay. So now we want to start looking at what it means to get into Christ. That will bring us to Galatians 3, 27, where the Apostle Paul simply said, He, uh, know you not so many of us as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. The, how does one get into Christ? Galatians 3, 27, baptized into Christ. There's a difference between in and into. In is the condition of already being located uh, inside the confines of an area. Into is the point of going from outside to inside. How do we get into Christ? We know that that's where all spiritual blessings are. We can ask a person, are you in Christ? Well, when does that happen? Galatians 3.27, as many as were baptized into Christ. How does one get into Christ? According to Galatians 3.27, baptism. Now combine that with Ephesians 4, 5, wherein the Apostle Paul would say, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. According to Paul, is there more than one valid baptism in God's will? He said there's one. Side note, you can read through Scripture and see several different 
ideas pertaining to baptism. There's a reference to uh, uh, baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, as John would discuss, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 3. There were the, uh, the washings of the Jews. There was the baptism of John, Acts 19. But Paul said there's one baptism. There's one valid baptism to become a Christian. Now, since God accepts, Ephesians 4, 5, only one baptism, must we be careful to be sure that we are baptized the way that God says? If there's only one, then do we need to be careful to make sure that we've done the one? Obvious answer, yes. Next verse, Acts 8, 36 and 30, through 38. Here's Philip and the eunuch. As they went on their journey, they came to certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And they straightway uh, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. That being said, the first question under Acts 8, 36, Did Philip baptize the eunuch in water? Yes. They went down into the water. So did both Philip and the eunuch go down into the water? Yes. The next question, would it have been necessary for both Philip and the eunuch to go down into the water if sprinkling or pouring were the one baptism that God commands? Uh, w would they have needed to enter a body of water that was big enough to uh, encompass them if the same job could have been done by taking the water bottle that would have been nearby and just spritzing the eunuch? Obvious answer being no. So, would it have been necessary for them to go down into that water if the sprinkling or pouring were valid? No, but, next question, would it have been necessary for both Philip and the eunuch to go down into the water if immersion were the one baptism God commanded? Yes. By the way, there are some that have tried to say, well, you, you don't know they uh, were, the eunuch just said, see, here is water. Maybe they had water right there in the chariot. I don't know that they went down into a bottle of water or, or a, a hydrated uh, skin of water. No. Here's water. Here's a body of water, large enough for them both to enter it. Let's move forward. We return to 1 Peter 3.21. And in so doing, Peter said, The light figure whereunto baptism doth now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, according to 1 Peter 3, 21, in the one baptism, must there be the answering of a good conscience toward God? The answer being yes. It's not some mere formality. It's not something that can be engaged upon someone beyond that person's will. Like the story that's told of a man in the Lord's church whose daughter's boyfriend had gone to the, the, uh, the beach with them and he snuck up behind him in the ocean and dunked him and said, there, now you're a Christian. You have to wonder if the father really knew what it meant to be a Christian if he thinks that a surprise dunk qualifies as baptism. No, Peter said it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Thus, it's a decision on the part of the one being baptized. And the reason that's important, the next question, can a baby conscientiously accept baptism as a command of God. A baby can't decide which flavor of Gerber it wants. Can, can a baby make those sorts of decisions? We could take it further. Uh, doesn't it take some age to be able to make those sorts of decisions and count the cost and conscientiously decide? Thus, we move forward. When we talk about baptism, it's not something that's just done to someone. It's some, something to which a person submits. Romans 6, 3. Know you not that so many of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we're buried with Him by baptism into death. That like was Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, so shall we also be in the likeness of His resurrection. There are a series of questions that follow this uh, passage. The first one being, does the Bible describe the one baptism as a burial in water? The answer, of course, being yes. Now, souls at this point have to know that they are lost because we don't baptize saved people. 
That means that we have to allow souls to come to the realization as we're studying sin that they have it. And even those that thought they were saved as this study begins, they'll acknowledge they've had sin before, but they're convinced theirs is gone as they study about what the one baptism is. And maybe they compare immersion to the sprinkling they received as an infant. Or they compare immersion to the, the pouring to which they, uh, they thought they had submitted uh, as a teenager. Whatever the case, as they compare what they've done with what the Bible says and, see, and they see that the two aren't the same, there's going to come a point where the person is going to say, that's not what I did. Am I saved? Or they may just go ahead and arrive at the conclusion, that's not what I did. No one's told me this before. No one showed me this. I've never realized it. I'm not saved. They have to get to that point. It's not an easy moment. But they have to get to that point if ever they're going to take advantage of the cleansing blood of Christ. So, as we talk about this burial that is a baptism, or this baptism is a burial, it's important to remember that at some point over the course of these questions, the light should flash. So, we think about the next chart that's going to be utilized. And in the booklet that you were given today, there's also a bookmark. The bookmark has the words, the gospel enacted on one side, the gospel reenacted on the other. Personally, I uh, prefer to describe this as here's what Jesus did, and will I do this for him? We talk about what the gospel is. Jesus died for us, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 through 8. Jesus was buried. He rose again. He left witnesses. Now, you compare that description of the, the heart of the gospel from 1 Corinthians 15 with what's said in Romans 6. We're buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also walk in newness of life. We die with Him in baptism. We're raised to walk in a new life. He died, was buried, and rose again for us. Well, we do the same with Him. This bookmark essentially being just an illustration to help uh, the person with whom you're studying visualize it. Now that being put in front of us, we move forward to the next question. If, uh, where do we get the benefits of the death of Jesus according to Romans 6, 3 and 4? Well, the Bible says we're, uh, baptism is a burial and the benefits of the death of Jesus are going to come when we're in Christ and we're baptized into Christ. Therefore, the benefits of the death of Jesus come at baptism. We go ahead and move forward. The next question, if you are baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? Of course, the answer to that being no. If I do it the way the Bible says to do it, that's going to be the right way. Contrasting question. If you are not baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? Yes. Yes, indeed. Do you want to take a chance on missing salvation? This is a gain commitment question. This is one that is indeed intended to uh, uh, appeal to the heart, to offer a challenge. This is one that may take a person a moment to answer. Do you want to take a chance on missing heaven? Am I taking it? No, I know I don't. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That question gives the person an opportunity to declare a confession, to, to acknowledge the reality of Christ. We go ahead and move forward. As we have seen, Jesus commands repentance. Are you willing to start making the changes in your life that Jesus commands and, and to live for God? Once again, this is giving a person an opportunity to acknowledge outwardly and to, to make a commitment to repentance. We've already discussed the necessity of it earlier in the study. Do you believe He's the Son of God? Are you ready to repent? Hopefully the person's willing to say yes. Then we move forward. Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Chances are the person with whom you're studying is still going to say yes at this point. And that's okay. That, that person is probably going to think, yes, I've been baptized uh, for the remission of sins. We can 
make some comparisons. The next question asks, if you were taught you had remission of sins before baptism, could you have been baptized for the remission of your sins? In other words, if you, taught, if you were taught that you were already forgiven, then could you have been baptized in order to get forgiveness? No, I'd, I'd, if I was baptized because I done had it, then I done had it. Okay, is that what Peter described in Acts 2.38? These are the series of questions that help people draw the conclusions that need to be drawn. If you were taught that you were saved before baptism, could you have been baptized in order to be saved? Once again, much like the previous question, the answer being no. If you were taught that you already had the benefits of being in Christ before you were baptized into Christ, then could you have been baptized in order for the benefits? The answer being no. Since God describes the one baptism as a barrel in water. Could you have been scripturally baptized if water was sprinkled or poured on you? It's at this point that it's important to note that a person cannot be taught the wrong thing and then obey the right thing. Obedience is not an accident. Submission to God is not a, oh, I lucked up. No. Could you have been taught wrongly and baptized rightly? No. So if I were taught the wrong thing about the point at which a person is saved, if I were taught the wrong thing about the very act of baptism, whether it's a sprinkling or pouring, if I were taught the wrong thing uh, about the body to which the Lord adds me, then is my baptism a valid one? Since God describes the one baptism as a barrel in water, could you have been scripturally baptized if water were sprinkled or poured on you? The answer being no. Now, it's at this point, that we can look at the back to the Bible survey that we've done with the person and look at the answers that were given. We recall that survey. We had it on our first study. And you can take a look at if you've been baptized, were you saved before or after baptism? More often than not, the answer that the folks with whom we're studying have given is going to be before. And that answer will not correlate with Scripture. Therefore, that baptism will not correlate with Scripture, and it's not a valid one. This is not a gotcha moment. Hopefully, it's an aha moment for the person with whom we're studying. Hopefully, it's a moment of realization and conclusion, uh, uh, illumination, if you will. It's not a moment of personal victory for the person doing the study. But hopefully, we're working toward a heavenly victory for the student with whom we're studying. So, we go ahead and we move forward to the next question. John 14, 15. If we really love Jesus, if we really love Christ, will we want to obey Him? John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, if we love Him, we'll do it the way He said, right? There's a chart that we can utilize, that's chart 26, and it gives a contrast. Which one have we done? Have we called on the name of the Lord? Or uh, the chart listing the ideas as described, which comes first? Call on the name of the Lord, uh, be forgiven, be saved, and then be baptized, or repentance? Then uh, submit to baptism, be saved, calling on the name of the Lord. Those two are completely different series of events and only one fits the scriptural depiction. The reason that's going to be important is as we come to John 14, 15, if we love Him, we'll keep His commandments. Well, do we love Him? And if we've not kept His commandments yet, are we willing to do that now? Since Jesus wants you to be baptized, and now that you understand the importance of baptism right now, wouldn't it please Jesus for you to be baptized right now? Hopefully the answer that's given will be yes. As you move through the rest of this study, there are three more pages, 10, 11, 12, 13, actually four more pages. You'll see a series of asterisks. The last question we just examined has an asterisk beside it, as does... Uh, as do two questions on page 11. And those questions typically are connected to uh, the idea of now or right now. Those are gain commitment questions. 
And if at this point in the study the person says, yes, I should be baptized right now, we don't say, okay, that's great, let's finish the study first. <laughs> when the person says, I'm ready, ready, put the booklet down, have a prayer, and go to the baptistry or the pool or the creek or whatever is nearby. But if the person's not ready yet, the questions that follow are very much uh, intended to close the study, if you will. They're very self-explanatory, and we will be able in weeks to come to look over some of these ideas. For now, the, the important aspect is going to be this. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do we? Have we? We can't win souls to Christ in all honesty and integrity unless we're willing to follow Him ourselves. Maybe it's the case this afternoon that as you consider decisions you've made, things you've done, it's time to be made right with God. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ and you're ready to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Or maybe, maybe you're a child of God whose life has not been what it ought to be right now are you ready to make things right and right now if so why not take the opportunity why not come forward while we stand together and while we sing